Hey, welcome to the closing beat, everybody. Happy, happy Wednesday. It's not Tuesday, it's Wednesday. Shortened holiday week here. I hope you're having a great day. We're financial advisors here at Jazz Wealth. I hope you'll consider us open or transfer your account. Uh, Roth IRAs, IRAs, things like that. We're investment managers. We actually handle the investments for you, uh, but nobody will treat you like we will, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, we don't, I don't care whether you have $1,000, you have a million dollars. I'm going to go through everything with you just like anybody else would. We just kind of don't like that the bigger financial advisors say you got to have a lot of money to work with them. Otherwise, they just won't help you out. So we'll do handle your investments. We use our own expense-free funds here. So um, you can see them right on the website, actually. We're getting ready to upgrade that, make it a little sweeter. But um, we use uh, expense-free funds, so there's no conflict of interest. Happy to work with you. I hope you'll keep us in mind. This is just a quick show that we do about the stock markets to update our clients as well as update you guys that like to kind of follow along day by day and see how the stock markets did. So we'll dive into that now. We're also playing a game. It's called Guess the Dow. Every Friday, uh, if you're the closest without going over, we'll send you a $100 gift card. And if you're one of our customers, uh, we can credit your account if you like. You can also have the gift card. No, nothing wrong with that. Uh, or if you happen to win and you say, hey, I'll just open an account with you guys. Put the $100 towards that. You can. You don't have to. You can take the $100 gift card and go spend it on whatever you can think about. Well, anyways, hey, we got the Dow higher by 237 today. You got the S&P 31 and 102 on the NASDAQ. Uh, overnight, futures uh, got a little boost there because Hong Kong uh, officially withdrew their extradition bill, which is the, the fancy way of saying, hey, that's why they were protesting. So uh, lots of good news over there for them. It helped their markets a little bit, but more importantly, helped ours just a little bit more. Maybe now the attention can turn back to trade. I don't know. 100% to trade? I'm not sure. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, did get a little blip here earlier in the day. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. Uh, the ISM manufacturing numbers came out and they contracted, which is just a fancy way of saying they went under 50% uh, for the first time in three years. Now, the Fed watches this number closely, uh, and you kind of maybe saw on TV, financial media, things like that, all of a sudden people talking about this number. They'll probably talk about it even more going forward uh, because it's something that the Fed watches. It's a recession type indicator, kind of like the inversion that we talked about. Um, now, we just did an awesome class for our customers last week to explain the yield curve inversion, how it works, what does it mean. And even though we inverted, the real recession indicator comes afterwards. And so we actually pointed it out, showing each one how this works every single time and how we'll go forward to do that. So if you're one of our customers, you might want to go check that out. It's a rather short video, but it's a good one. Lots of great geeky details in there. Um, Here's the thing, though. Uh, it's not a very good recession indicator. I'm going to actually try to just pull up. Did I save this? Let me see if I could just do this, because if I have this, I'd like to just share it with you. Um, it may not be perfect, because I can't make this chart any bigger. Can I? No, I can't. But actually, uh, here you go. It's part of it. So uh, this is the manufacturing production index that came out yesterday. It went below 50, right? This is the 50% mark. People in, uh, say, oh, that means recession's coming up. However, in the gray area there, you can actually see the last three recessions going back to 1991. And uh, so what's happened here is there's too many false indicators. There are too many times where we dip below 50 and there is no recession of any kind. Uh, there's been three dips below 50 uh, and still no recession. Um, you've got a couple false indica uh, false sort of blips on the radar here. It just It's not a very good indicator. So if you go back and you study it, you won't fall for that sort of nonsense on there. Also, uh, the average gain for the market is exactly 7% um, when a after dipping below this here, right? So even if we do, here, we can actually just pull it up, can't we? If I put the S&P 500 on here, the market, ooh, that's kind of a sloppy looking chart. Uh, the market's actually higher all but one time, one year later, when we do blip below. And that's just the 2008 area here. We blip below 50%. And of course, you know what happened uh, in the 2008 time period. One year later, we were still not above that high. Every other time, when we blip below the 50 mark, one year later, we're higher by an average of 7%. So the ISM manufacturing number really doesn't I don't want to say it doesn't mean anything, but it really is not a very good um, economic indicator in terms of recession. Now, um, the reason, one of the reasons for that is, you know this, it is, and I'm not teaching you something new, but you know that over the last decade, maybe a little bit longer, manufacturing is not as, it doesn't have that same oomph as it did GDP-wise. In fact, it only accounts for 12%. Um, what has sort of taken over? Services, right? Services. That's the real focus. So. 
manufacturing, we, we wonder, does it have the same effect? And that comes up. You might see it if they keep talking about it. People say, yeah, but does it have the same effect because we don't manufacture as much as we used to? Small, maybe just a little bit, but um, services are really taking over. So with that in mind, not to make a long story out of this, tomorrow is really the important number that comes out. It's called the non-manufacturing uh, ISM number. The ISM is just the company that puts it together. Um, the non-manufacturing number comes out tomorrow. A lot of people will call that the services number because it's really focused on that end of the spectrum. That may be the real important one that we want to watch as far as uh, recession type indicators. So uh, that will come out tomorrow. We'll take a look there. But now you kind of have a general idea of how things work uh, as far as that goes. Didn't mean to bore you if you don't enjoy that sort of thing. Okay, uh, so we talked about the stock market positive on the day, positioning itself to possibly break out. We've talked about the catalyst maybe needed to break above these highs here. We don't have it yet. That's why we didn't break out today. There's really nothing amazing that causes the market to break out. I don't think we're going to just bleed above the highs and somehow just continue on as if these series of highs never existed. I do think that if we do move above this, that's where the excitement starts again. You'll see people want to chase that. You'll see the short-term short traders want to start covering their positions. Uh, so in the S&P 500, we are set. The market is saying we're positioned and ready to break back up here and head to highs. Give us something. Give us a reason to get excited. Wouldn't you just be surprised if tomorrow so happen to be the news that comes out that helps us get all excited again. Let's see what happens. It's just, just for fun. We'll follow up on that. In the S&P 500, old WDC broke out. We talked about this the past few days being a potential breakout candidate there. It did today, a little extended there, went a little too far, too fast, all in one day. So a small pullback just gives other people a chance to dive in if they want to dive in. Uh, in the, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying generally, traders in, in general. Um, PVH, this is Calvin Klein and, and, and Hilfiger and th those sort of brands, the clothing company. They own these brands. Uh, the stock was higher by about 9.13% actually, to be exact. Uh, the CEO bought $10 million worth of shares. Well, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you know that? He likes a discount. We now know the CEO of PVH likes to buy a discounted stock. That helped a lot of the retailers today. Uh, Tapestry got a new CEO. This one is really cool. Can I just say this for a second? I'm, I don't know this. I'm not a magic or have this in my head. But I did a video on Tapestry uh, after their earnings to explain kind of what they're doing, what the problems were, how they plan to solve that. Remember, go back and watch. It's a public video. You can watch it. Um, we talked about them focusing on the technology side of things, right? Well, what did they do today? They hired a guy from Goldman Sachs. Um, where, where did I put his name? Did I put his name down? He's an ex-Goldman Sachs executive with a specialty in that technology side. He knows that area of the market. So you go back a couple weeks, we do the video on Tapestry. Tapestry tells you and tells everybody, hey, we know earnings wasn't, wasn't all that good. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on technology to improve everything. They then prove it to you by going out and getting the very guy that they probably need to get the job done. He's now the new CEO. So that just shows you, if you keep track of these stuff, we happen to own this stock, so it just, it's something that I keep track of. But if you keep track of these things, all of a sudden now you can say, they said they were going to improve here. They, they are improving here. They got the right guy. Holy cow. Obviously other investors saw that today. 5% to the upside. Very cool. I just enjoy watching that sort of thing uh, progress in real time because it starts to make you feel like, wow, I can just... You can tell what's going to happen. Um, anyways, let's move on. Uh, Micron. So Micron uh, and the semiconductors in general did well today. Uh, Micron was higher by a total of 4% on the day. Intel was higher. We'll go through some of the other names in a minute. Uh, but you guys said you kind of might like this sort of thing. So I'm going to point this out on a few stocks, and then you can just bash me if you don't like this. But um, Mizuho, uh, or I think they just say Mizu, just to keep it short, uh, raised their price target. They raised it from $44 all the way up to 50. Now he kind of had to, right? He already hit his price target. So he had to raise his price target to 50. Uh, average analyst estimate on this stock is $49, by the way, which puts it basically at these prior highs. Assumes there's another 4% up, uh, upside potential there, if that's how you want to say it. Now, this analyst, by the way, for Mizuho or Mizu or however you say that there, uh, he is 61% profitable over his entire lifespan as an analyst. Uh, in fact, he's gotten 224 of the 369 recommendations to buy, sell, or do whatever have been profitable, right? Meaning from the time he makes the recommendation, one year later, that that's the cutoff. Was he profitable or not in any amount? Right. And so actually 61% of the time he's profitable. Average return for him when he on these suggestions is 19%. Uh, so 
Overall, you would say 61% doesn't sound real good, but when he's right, man, 19% average gain there. That's pretty cool. I'd be interested to know what happens when he's wrong. <laughs> how much does, how far off is he? Uh, but those are some of the stats on uh, Micron. And so uh, one of the reasons why it was higher today, uh, again, average analyst price targets 49. So you only really got another 4% there until some of them are going to have to make some decisions as well. Uh, but looking good. Micron in general. Let's put the charts back up so you can play along. There we go. Uh, also in the S&P 500, you got Tyson. Uh, they were lower today, 7% on the downside there. They cut their full year guidance going forward. Look, the stock has had an amazing run. So today the company says we're cutting our forecast going forward. Uh, poultry and meat prices are too volatile right now. We're not sure about pricing there in terms of what it's really going to cost us. And that's not the end of the world. Tyson's done this numerous times over the years. So you've got to imagine meat and poultry prices have been sort of volatile in the past. Um, what's happened, though, is the stock price has had such a great run. You, they just gave everybody a reason to say, all right, well, we'll take some profit off the table, right? We'll just take a little money out there, hope it pulls back, and then they'll buy some more. That's exactly what happened on Tyson today. So not one of those end-of-the-world type charts to me. It's just people being given a reason by the company specifically to take action. And uh, who could blame them? You would take a little profit. All right, in the, oh, let's do the Dow. Did I not cover the Dow? Uh, we use the DIA. So the Dow sitting here around these highs as well, a little bit better off along with the NASDAQ doing well in, inside of that. You got Intel, one of the semiconductors. This was actually the best performer in the Dow today, up 4%. Um, semis, just strong in general. Nike was the second best performer, uh, was up, let's call it 2%. UBS has a price target now of 87. I didn't get the analyst, uh, analyst success on that one. I did a couple others here. Um, he went from 84 to 87 based on a study that they did that said Nike is the most loved athletic brand. Their words, not mine. All right. Uh, so you got UNH a little bit lower. That was the weakest performer in the Dow today. Healthcare continues to be at that turning point uh, in the drug companies. You got UNH, Pfizer, uh, Merck. Those were the three losers in the Dow here today. If I go over to the healthcare sector, we've talked about this going forward. That this is, believe it or not, everybody's just looking at two simple lines on a chart. You got a downtrend line, you got an uptrend line, call it whatever you like, but we're stuck in between. And notice how the price keeps compressing. As those lines get tighter and tighter, price compresses, excitement compresses, emotion starts to compress, and it needs to be released. It will be released one way or the other. The magic sauce is if you can guess which way it's going to go. I hope it goes to the upside, uh, but we'll see what happens there. <laughs> so uh, that's the Dow and some of the sectors inside of it. I'll point out ATVI because I know some of you have this position in here. This is what we've been talking about, that breakout from about, what, five days ago, saying, okay, that's fine that it broke out, but now you want to see other people join you. You want to see the momentum build. You need other people to start saying, yep, it's time to buy ATVI. It had a couple quiet days there, and today you got BMO upgrading ATVI. The stock was higher by 5%. Very, very helpful. So if you have been in that stock or have invested in that one, good job. You held in through a couple quiet days there, and so far, so good. Here's the stats on this. The BMO analyst has now a $60 price target. That puts it about 12% higher on the day. Average analyst estimate is 4% higher, so they're going to have to start raising their targets or adjusting their targets here going forward. Here's the thing. The analyst that jumped to the front of the line to get the attention with that $60 price target needed to jump to the front of the line. He needed the attention because he's only 48% profitable on his calls. He's young. 77 of his last 161 calls are profitable one year later. His average return is only 5%. This is not an analyst that people will get excited about. He's still building his foundation there. He's not a bad guy. I'm not saying he's horrible. It's just he doesn't have a lot of uh, a lot of experience, right? He just hasn't been around too long. So, um, I mean, relative to others, but, uh, so he's, you know, maybe not the one you want to follow. I'm not, not telling you not to, but you know, he's maybe not the one you want to follow. So what I did is I went to the best analyst. I found the best performing analyst that covers this stock. He is actually profitable 76% of the time. His average return is 26%. So this is a guy that's got a track record now. He's been around for a long time. He's an older guy too. Um, now, he says uh, $55 is the price target. So he's about to have to start making some decisions whether he thinks the stock should have a new price target, whether they should upgrade it or not, or just change their price target. Uh, but the bottom line is there, uh, the analyst that upgraded ATVI today got everybody's attention, and that's what he needed to do. 
get their attention to go, oh yeah, ATVI just broke out. It may be a little bit higher. All those analysts lower can now jump on to his uh, sort of recommendation there. So more of a strategy move for him rather than maybe something all the, all that interesting. I, I don't know. I just, I find it kind of interesting. So those are some of the stats you guys were asking. Could we track it? It's actually on that screen right there in the middle. Uh, it, yeah, you really can't see it. I'm sorry. Well, anyways, it's right there in the middle. You can't move. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Anyways, uh, where was I? Well, we're going back to the charts. All right. So uh, Ulta had a sort of little conversation with a customer. Uh, Ulta fell 3.6%. Now, remember, we reported their earnings to you. We told you that Ulta essentially volunteered to give up the rest of the year. They said that they don't expect a positive next quarter. And so because of that, lowering their estimates and everything, in the comments from the CEO, because of that, this is one of those that falls and you say, well, why should I dive in? There's no good reason. Imagine a fund manager, hedge fund, mutual fund, whatever. Imagine a fund manager that owns this position and he wants to buy more. Why? What's the good reason? Everyone's going to look forward and say, the company is all but gave up on the next quarter, right? So why would we dive in early? Let's wait and see how the next quarter goes, or at least until closer to the next quarter to see if we can get any sort of scent in the wind as to how things are going on. Because of that, you see no buying. Yeah, it's very extended. It's a very, very extended stock. Today, it continues to sell off because of that very thing. You saw the pressure all day if you watched this. The market would just try to creep up and, and Ulta would creep a little bit lower because no one has a reason to dive in. That was a conversation I had with a customer. I want to share that with you guys because if you're looking at Ulta and you say that's a discount, you better hope and pray, which are the two four-letter words you just don't use in the stock market, you better hope and pray that for some reason you're a short-term trader and you're playing for 2% or you're playing for a $2 or $3 move throughout the day or something. Other than that, the longer-term investor is going to sit back and wait for no fear that this is going to rally and rocket without them. you got to have that same mindset if you're an investor there or at least be able to pick up on that stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really have a good reason for sharing that with you. I just thought it was one of the worst performers today, so I thought I'd share it with you. Oil, back to those simple two little lines, right? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to follow two lines. You just got to know when people are looking at those different lines there, and oil is one of those areas. It stopped perfectly today. It had a great rally all day long. Yeah, we're doing well, doing well, looking good, looking good. Oh, there's that line. Stop, right? You can actually see the very moment where people said, oh, those darn lines to the penny. Well, tick. We have to say to the tick because I'm showing you the futures here. So anyways, uh, it's a good sign, right? In general, it's good momentum going into tomorrow. It's good steam. It's building up that pressure. If we do get above those highs, uh, you could see some excitement tomorrow. So maybe we'll put this whole thing behind us by the end of tomorrow. We'll see what happens. I already mentioned it. Semiconductor's doing really well. Um, I would still say that it seems like it's going to wait and hold and sort of chop around. I don't feel like you miss out on this big blast off. Now, if there's a trade deal, all bets are off. The thing rockets and you just, it's the end of the day. Uh, but semiconductors had a good day today. Uh, Mexico, sneaky little rally. Just want to point this one out here. Mexico has been trending lower and over the last few days here, just sort of blasted off. Like nobody's talked about it. Just, this is the EWW. It's a Mexican ETF. All of a sudden, just a little momentum there, volume creeping up a little bit and that pressure to the upside. You can see intraday if you happen to be following along. And so uh, that's that one. Now, sector wise, a lot of great moves today, but no real progress. For example, you got metals and mining. Great day today, but is that exciting? Do you look at that chart and say, bam, it's a new breakout. It's the start of an uptrend. It's something going on that's exciting. Communication services. What's well, a choppy mess? Yeah, today was a good day, but does it tell you anything new? If you're a moving average person, you go, those things are flat. I don't know what to do. If you're a, a price support and resistance guy, you go, I don't know what, what I'm reading here. I don't, was that resistance? Where's the support? I have no idea. If you're a trend person, you go out in the short term. I don't see a trend. I don't know what to expect there. So unfortunately, that's the case for a lot of different sectors. Now, that doesn't matter if the market's really positioning itself to break above those highs that we talked about because each one of these sectors, tech sector, here you go, starting to show a little momentum to the upside. Is this the beginning of them moving out of this overall chop, messiness, consolidation, let's call it August forget type trading where nothing really happened, right? Is, that the, is this the start? Is this the very day I'm able to point out that the momentum is building to start the new trend, to get the moving averages moving again, to get above price resistance and start convincing more and more of the traders and, and investors that have all their different rules that they use uh, to invest? Is this the start of it? It sort of feels like that. I will still maintain that I think we need 
a catalyst. We need something. It's not earning season. We don't have a trade deal officially. We need a catalyst of some kind. We just don't have it at the moment. Anyways, you got home builders. Great day today. Everything looks good, but it's a choppy mess sitting here at highs. No matter what technical type trader you are, fundamentally, you got nothing new to go on. And that worries me, right? That you have this sort of thing going on. There's just not much to get excited about. Maybe lower rates. I don't know if you like that. Uh, industrial, same thing. Great day, but in a whole choppy mess inside of this thing here. Who knows what's going on? Uh, transports fresh off their correction bounce, eh, but still a lot of resistance overhead. You got flat moving averages. The more you go through these sectors, the more you go, how do I get excited? How do I get excited about the markets moving to highs? Am I going to have to bet on utilities? Am I going to have to bet on REITs again? Am I going to have to just keep diving into silver? It's ridiculous how crazy that is. You need all these sectors to start waking up. So that's the real message I was trying to eh, sort of portray to you today. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's dive in here. Just a few more things maybe, and then I'll answer your questions. Yeah, 62 new 52 week highs today. That is a short term record. We had six uh, sectors represented and I will say half of them, exactly half of them today were REITs or utilities. And you think I'm about to say, oh man, that sucks. You know, that's the uh, sectors keep holding us up. But remember yesterday it was three quarters of all the new 52 week highs were, um, from REITs and utilities. So that shows that there were other areas of the market that actually started to help out today. And in fact, if I look through them, in the consumer sector, you got Hershey's, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble. In the financials, you actually had more than just REITs today. You had MasterCard in there. You had a brokerage, uh, brokerage firm, it's called Market Access. It, it's a, um, I believe it's more like commodities and, oh, bonds, they're bonds. They do bonds over there. Uh, so not like a retail brokerage firm. You had uh, ICE, the Intercontinental Exchange, and CME Group also making new highs in the financials. Um, what else did you have? Uh, Dr. Horton in the residential uh, home building space there. Waste Management, uh, L Lockheed Martin was in there. Pulte Homes, that's also a home builder. Uh, Walmart in your consumer services area. Uh, Akamai, that's a semiconductor, I guess. Uh, Clack Semiconductor, uh, Seagate, AT&T, Lamb Research Semiconductor. Uh, and then you got a bunch of utilities. So you had more of a spread in terms of, well, the different sectors that are trying to show momentum and move us higher here. The problem is they're all choppy in the short term. And so people are sort of needing to pick up on that. If you're not a, picking up on the fact that all these sectors are starting to give you a little bit of strength, then you have, and you're just saying, I need a technical pattern. When this happens or price crosses above this or whatever, you're, you might get left in the dust, right? So you have to be able to sort of pick up on that. I think I've said enough about that, actually. You only had three new lows today. They were all drug names, uh, A Biomed, Bib, and uh, ILMN uh, to the downside. They're all weak in general. Um, and what else do we have? Uh, dividends uh, paid out today. These are stocks that we actually own. Um, you got Home Depot. Oh, wait, is that an old list there? You got Home Depot. No, that's right. Uh, Home Depot, BlackRock, and Houlihan, which is uh, sort of like an advisor investment bank sort of company there uh, all reporting dividends 31 cents a dollar 36 and 330 respectively no need to explain what BlackRock does you guys probably are uh, know what the deal is on that one um, yeah last thing I guess I'll say is uh, Michael Burry you guys know the name there uh, big short guy the big short guy um, he says that he's found the next bubble he bet on the uh, all the, the debt the uh, CDOs and things from um, the financial crisis, the home price is getting too inflated. He says that the next bubble is in passive investing, and I happen to agree. Uh, so he was all over the place, Bloomberg and Wall Street Journal and everything, saying that's the next bubble, and that's what he's betting on. He manages quite a bit of money, by the way, so uh, he's making that bet. The, and by the way, the short story here is um, not that people passively investing will somehow change to active investing. What he's saying is he believes that the passive index-based investing is a bubble, uh, meaning when you say, oh, I don't need to uh, buy anything else but an index. Well, you're buying the index and then that money has to go into the individual stocks. So every time you buy the S&P or the NASDAQ or whatever, they have to go out and buy the stocks inside the S&P and the index. So he's essentially saying that a lot of stock prices are artificially inflated by all the passive investors moving into the index funds, which is this huge phenomenon right now. And the problem is those passive investors are historically known as being emotional investors. And it, they, uh, it was Principal or uh, Primer, not Primerica, Principal or Pacific Life or somebody did a study to say, hey, if you're an index fund investor, 
and the markets fall, would you sell and wait for the markets to fall even lower? And almost everybody said yes. I believe it was 88 or 86 percent of the people said yes, I would sell on the way down and hope to buy more on, on the downside. What, what are you happening? You're actually pushing the markets lower because if you're in an index and you decide I want to sell my index ETF or whatever, they have to then go take that, uh, those positions and sell them. So they have to sell Apple, they have to sell Ford, they got to sell Verizon in order to bring them back to whole, right? They don't need, you're not an investor anymore, so they can sell off those positions. So he's, Michael Burry is essentially saying, that's the bubble. You're going to have an influx of emotional index fund investors that say they're passive, uh, but then all of a sudden when the markets fall, they're going to start selling. The proof of that was actually October, November, December, you saw ETFs lose record amounts of money in just a little tiny drop in the market. I, 20% drop. I'm not going to say that's tiny, but a 20% drop was all it took. And that snowball effect to the downside that you see in December was, in fact, the index fund investors. Um, and they all missed out on the upside, at least according to the, the fund flow data, if you follow that sort of goodness. Anyways, I'll take a few questions from you here, and then we'll wrap it up. Happy to be uh, back on track here today. <laughs> um, Wow, okay, you guys have a lot of questions. Uh, ETFs, uh, passive investing, you toss money in it, let it die. <laughs> okay. Um, what's the speed of the long-term moderate ETF portfolio? You mentioned them all in yesterday, yesterday's video. Actually, so I know you're a customer there, Andrew. Uh, the class tomorrow, first time ever, we're going to do it this way. I'm actually going to show each portfolio against the market so you can see the exact speed at, visually. I haven't been able to do that in the past. We're really trying to up our game here a little bit. And uh, so I'm actually going to cover that. I'm going to go through all the aggressive funds and you're going to see how they correlate to the markets or whether they beat them or whatever. And then we'll go through the con uh, more conservative ones, the moderate one included. So uh, you're in for a treat. Yep. Or just a horrible disaster. Who knows? But so far, so good. I've, <laughs> I've been building out all the charts for you guys. Um, do passive index fund cause the stocks in a fund to be more volatile than broader in the market in the S&P versus the total market? If I understand your question right, no, those two are not correlated. They couldn't be correlated. Those two are one and the same. Um, if you bought Roku at 40 and you want to buy more shares, you want, nice. If you bought it at 40, first of all, very nice. Not, very nice job there. That, that's been a very, very impressive runner. Um, would I add more at this point? It'd be tough for me to suggest to add more because it is officially more than three standard deviations away from its 50-day moving average, which means it is extremely overbought in the short term and statistically very likely to pull back. This is, seems to be that last little wave of people getting excited about buying some Roku. I would, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying I would think it would pull back and you'd get a chance to buy it a little bit cheaper versus buying at these prices. I think if you were to buy today or wait, you'd find one month out, you could have bought cheaper. But I, I don't know. You know Got to be careful. <laughs> um, so actually, we can, we can uh, go back here. Uh, so the question is, uh, where is the question? Philip, what time will the ISM non-manufacturing numbers be released? Would anything over 50 be considered worth a rally in the market? No, the actual number is 42.8 or 9. I can't remember exactly. I don't have the number with me. But uh, 42.9 is in the services number is really the sort of indicator of a correction there. So it, not just because it falls, it's already under 50, I believe. Um, but that, it, it would be 42.9 or whatever it was. Gosh, did I write it down somewhere? Is it in the ticker below? It is in the, 42.9. Yeah, that's why I, anything above 42.9 is considered strong. So we've got a little wiggle room there. Sorry for the delay. Oh, and the number comes out uh, 10 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow. Yep. 10, 10 o'clock? Yeah, 10 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Dustin is a straight statistics and numbers guy. No emotions. Yeah, it's hard to get emotional around the stats. I did have a few stats for you, by the way, for your care. Uh, Campbell's Soup, from where it's trading at today, the average one-week return is minus 1.5%. Uh, it is only positive from this very moment 24% uh, of the time, meaning uh, essentially 76% of the time, Campbell's Soup will be lower one week from today by an average of 1.5%. We'll follow up with that and see what happens there. Kind of cool. And a bunch of no-namers there. That's all I have for you. Tomorrow, earnings-wise, what do we have? Anything? CN, Sienna, uh, DocuSign, Lululemon, and Zoomies. Uh, some of the bigger names to report tomorrow. 
Uh, does Signet report tomorrow? I don't show it on my list. Oh, they do. Yeah, they report tomorrow. Expecting 26 cents a share uh, earnings. They'll report before the market opens tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't see that one. Yeah. Um, Wise Home. I didn't see Home today. Is it down? I was looking at, uh, I missed Slack, by the way. I show Home at Home Group. Is it down a little bit after hours? Yeah, it looks like it's down a little bit. Uh, that's unfortunately one that's been pretty crushed there. Um, looks like sales, their, their net sales outlook going forward a little bit lower and guidance a little bit lower as well. That will hit it. Other than that, uh, basically a mixed earnings there. So hope that helps. That's just a very quick overview. I, I didn't dig into it. Yep. Uh, technology, is it truly a cyclical, not just discretionary spending anymore? Uh, well, so, uh, software as a service has been a big one in there as well. Um, so I would say yes, because that is definitely a cyclical sort of thing. Well, I can use me as an example. Uh, the software that we pay for, if things were to get a little bit weak, I could cut half of them out. I wouldn't use them, right? So they're falling, that's actually the best performing area of the tech sector this year, is that software as a service um, category. So I would think absolutely if I understand your question right, which I hope I did. Anyways, that's all I have for you here today. I think we've uh, basically covered all that we have to cover. I'm gonna get ready for our class tomorrow. Really, really good one. Um, I just This is our monthly update we do for customers where even if there's not a lot of adjustments, I like to show everybody pretty much how the hot dog's made, right? If you're interested in that sort of thing, we do it once a month for our customers, but every week I do a class to teach you something new Short, of course, but it's live. I'll answer your questions and stay as long as need be. And uh, hey, give us a shot. Check it out. Uh, open or transfer your account to Jazz Wealth if you happen to think about us. Otherwise, you don't need us. No problem. Maybe you'll hit the thumbs up button, right? I, I did it. <laughs> I remembered to say hit the thumbs up button or subscribe or something. Shoot. I, yeah. All right. That's something. If you just click a button on there, whatever you happen to click, we're just happy you clicked it. Have a great rest of your day. Uh, talk to you tomorrow. Hey, wait. Before you go watch one of our other great videos, have you had a chance to see our new FinTips videos? They focus on one topic at a time, covering investing, personal finance, and anything that can quickly help you with your dough. Best of all, we'll keep it real short, because we know time is money. Why should you choose Jazz Wealth as your retirement or long-term investing service? Our portfolios are managed by us, not some faceless mutual fund manager. Our private classes will teach you everything about investing and getting your dough straight. Best of all, our fiduciary standard means your best interest comes before ours.